My, my, my. Woo! Man. I don't know about you, but I think I got saved this morning. Amen. How about you? Amen. God's good, worthy of all of our praise. Amen, amen, and amen. Wow, are you blessed? Amen. Hallelujah. This morning I want to continue on, you know, with our thought process, the Christmas dilemma. And I want to minister this morning out of some scriptures in the book of Luke, the second chapter, verses 1 through 7. Part of the very story, you know, that we're all familiar with. And let me read them to you and then we'll sort of move on from that standpoint. Share a few thoughts and then we have a video that we want to share with you. And another, another special song. And, and let God minister into our hearts and lives and the thought process today. With regards to the thought that centers around today's story. In the book of Luke, the second chapter, verses 1 through 7. It said that at that time, the Roman, Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout uh, the Roman Empire. All returned to their own ancestral times to register for this uh, census. And because Joseph was the descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem to, in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth to Galilee. He took with him Mary, his, his fiance, who is now pregnant. And, and listen to this verse, and I'm going to come back to it again in the process of my message. And it says, and while they were there, it says the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him in snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger, manger because there was no lodging available for them. No lodging available for them. Over the past few weeks, we've been sharing thoughts about our Christmas series, The Christmas Dilemma. We've been looking at the dilemmas different individuals in life faced when they came face to face with what many of us come face to face with and we don't recognize. They came face to face with the plans God set into motion. Especially during this first Christmas season. When Christ our Lord and our Savior came into the world. And hopefully began to see that the dilemmas that these individuals themselves faced are literally the very same kind of dilemmas that you and I face in our lives. And through life's dilemmas, hopefully we'll discover, like they discovered, that God is trying to teach us the things that we need to learn so that we can become everything that He's called us to become. Can I tell you this morning that you are special to God? You truly are. You are a unique and special individual. Created in the image of God. We shared that earlier. But even in the midst of that greatness of God sharing. And how God loves us. And all that God does in our hearts and lives. And all he wants to accomplish. We need to recognize how God's goodness and mercy and grace. Always overshadows our hearts and lives. And that we are special. So don't let Satan tell you otherwise. Even though he's always trying to. He tried to tell me that today. But guess what I've discovered. I'm special. Mm -hmm. Now you may not think I am. But I know that I am. Not because of me. But because of him. And the same applies to each and every single one of us in the real, you know, reality of our lives. Now a couple of weeks ago we looked at Joseph and the dilemma that he faced. And that was the dilemma of our doubts. I mean he had questions. He wondered what in the world was going on. And that's a dilemma that every single one of us face in life itself. And, and when, when he discovered what God was teaching him through the midst of his doubts, he discovered some things that you and I hopefully can discover out of the midst of when you and I face doubts in life. And we talked about that simple truth. And God's always wanted us to teach us in the midst of the doubts that we're facing that he asks us this question, am I going to trust you in spite of all that's going on? And, and you might be needing to ask yourself that question. Am I going to trust God in spite of what is going on around about me? Can I attest to you this morning that even in spite of what's going on, if you do trust God, all of a sudden, God shows up on the scene. And God reveals himself for who he is. And what you thought was an impossibility became possible. Why? Not because of you, but because of him. Amen? Somebody give him praise. 
And then we shared the second week as we looked at Mary and, we, and the dilemmas that she was facing. Last week we talked about the dilemma of saying yes. Again, it's about trusting God. I mean, isn't all of life about whether or not I trust God? I mean, isn't that what your life truly is all about? If you, if you blow away all the chaff and you get rid of all the junk and all the things that seemingly get in the way, the question always is that lies before us, am I going to trust you? It's strange that God would bring your life and my life to that place, but it's the most important place we'll ever be. Not so much the question of whether I am or not, but when I come to the reality that no matter what, yes, I am going to trust you. And like with Mary, you know, it was a situation where, you know, in the midst of it, God asked her to say yes. And, and she looked at all the circumstances that by saying yes, she was going to face. I mean, you know, you want to impregnate me with the Holy Spirit that's never been heard of, never been done. And Lord, I'm not sure that this is going to happen. But nonetheless, I'm going to say yes to you and I want to trust you. Even though in the midst of her knowing that she was going to say yes, that she faced death. They were most likely going to take her out and stone her. Her husband was going to, her husband to be, was going to, you know, just just walk away from her. Her life was going to be ruined forever. And in her mind, she's thinking as this young woman that she was, I'm going to bear a child, and this child's going to be with me the rest of my days as a reminder that I'm rejected by everybody else. Think about that. But nonetheless. She chose to say yes. So that is a dilemma that we all face in life. But it's a dilemma that in the midst of choosing God over ourselves, we discover that the blessings of God become ours. Because when you honor God above everything else, all of a sudden what happens in your life is God starts to honor you. Because he's always looking for someone the scriptures say that his eyes search to and fro over this entire earth, constantly looking for someone. And may I paraphrase it this way, someone that he can look down and say, hmm, I see faith. I see someone that is going to trust me. And when God sees that, he turns his attention that way. And he moves and does what needs to be done. So saying yes is a, is a great thing. So this morning, I want to continue with a, a Christmas series looking at a, a title of today's message is, is The Dilemma of Our Belief. And, and hopefully you'll discover as I share with you this morning that when you and I face the, the dilemma of our belief, whether or not we're going to believe God and trust God in the midst of again, there it is again. It's always about trusting God. That what you're going to discover about the, the dilemma of belief that the innkeeper that we're going to talk about sort of discovered, and you and I need to discover, that it all centers around your belief system and my belief system, whether I trust God and whether I don't trust God, all centers around one thing. Understanding that God has a timetable. God has timing in everything that is done within the midst of his kingdom. And whether you believe it or not, you're part of that kingdom. Whether you're in it or you're out of it, you're still a part of it. And in the midst of that, God has a timing that is at work in your life and my life. And when I understand that, and I recognize that, that sort of brings about a great faith of believing God to do the wondrous, even though when I'm looking at what I see, and what I see is not what I perceive. And what in that perception I don't understand what is going on. I realize that God himself is still in control. And in that control, I don't need to worry. I just need to rest in him. Knowing that he's in charge. Join me for the next few moments as we watch the video. And then they sing a song. And then let God speak to us about the reality of the dilemma of our beliefs.
Speaking of miracles, there was that certain couple that showed up late tonight. I can't seem to shake the impression they made on me. The girl was more fatigued than a woman should ever look. All she wanted was just a place to rest. But I had nothing. The husband pleading with such desperation. But, what kind of businessman would take pause with that? What could I do? Bethlehem was packed. <laughs> no fault of my own. And that's where the book would have closed on the matter had it not been for my dear, dear sweet wife. The, the jab in the ribs from her finger telling me I might want to rethink my position on things. I very clearly knew my options. A, I could find them a place to sleep, or B, I could find myself a place to sleep. <laughs> Seriously, my wife, Estelle, had seen something that I had completely missed. The girl, she was pregnant. There was no way I was gonna leave her out in the cold night. But the barn, it was all ahead. They were grateful. There's just something different about them. Something. It's a quirky word, a word we simply don't use anymore, but holy. It's really the only word that fits. They say the baby, that he's the Messiah. The one who's gonna, who's gonna change everything. Could he really be the one that we've been waiting for after all these years? All my life, this belief has uh, paralyzed me, I suppose you could say. But this, this has given me a chance to believe. Bethlehem will be waking up soon. People gonna want food in their stomach. They're gonna be registering for the census. All these people in their own little worlds, no one knowing that a savior has entered the world. Out of all the places on earth, God chose, God chose, he chose my place to bring hope into the world. I'm certainly not a very worthy man, but I am a grateful one. And Estelle, I've never seen that woman happier in years. Ah. As for me, there will always be things to buy and sell, but this, all of this, this has given me a new kind of heart. A heart that believes. Oh, what a holy night.
God's good. Is there room in your heart? Amen. I mean, there's the question. Amen. Is there room in that heart? Wow. There's not room in your heart for him. You don't have room for anything. Amen. So I want to talk to you this morning about the dilemma of your belief, my belief, our belief. And tie into that thought process something that is relative to everything that goes on concerning how we believe, what we believe, and, and how it affects our life. And, and realize that in the midst of your believing, just as with the innkeeper, just as it was with Mary, as it was with Joseph, as it will be with the shepherds. We're going to talk about them next week, and then we're going to talk about the, one of the wise men on the, on the Christmas service. We're going to take a look at the reality of the simple fact that in the midst of belief systems, there's an element that is always going on that until you res re recognize it and allow it to, to have its liberty, if you will, within your life, you'll never achieve the maximum benefit of believing. Now what I mean by that is simply this. You know, I want to be talking about some scriptures in Hebrews about faith and talking about that a little bit in the midst of it. And most of you already know them. But the connection that I want to talk about is the God connection. The connection that God himself plays within the framework of all that goes on in our lives. And that when we recognize God in the midst of all that's going on, when we see him in the midst of what's taking place, and we realize that he is the one that is in charge. He is the one that is in control. All of a sudden, my belief system becomes easy. 
Because all of a sudden you see what's going on and what I'm having to trust in has nothing to do with me. But it has everything to do with him. And when I shift that responsibility, if you will, and no matter what's going on around about me, I see him in the midst of it. And I realize that he is in control and that he is working things in a measure that brings about his expected end. Then I can realize that my responsibility when it comes to me believing really is me really resting in him and that he is in control. He is in charge and that all I need to do is grab a hold of his hand and go along for his ride. Are you hearing me this morning? So you see, we're talking about a, the, the dilemma of belief. Because you see, throughout Scripture, if we pay attention to the Scriptures and really spend time in it, I'm going to share a few with you, we discover that God sets into motion a timetable for everything that takes place in your life, in all of life, as a matter of fact, even yours. He has a timetable. I mean, you take a look at Luke 2 and 6 that we just read. It says, and while they were there, what does it say? The time came for her baby to be born. In other words, God set into motion something throughout the eons of creation. When this point of time took place in the scriptures itself, what you and I fail to recognize, and before the world was ever created, God spoke. And said this time would take place. And he set into motion that time literally taking place at the exact moment that it needed to. That tells me something about the God that I know. The God that I serve. The one that is my Lord, my Savior, and my King who is soon to come. That he has a timetable in everything. And if I could just learn to rest in it. If I could just learn to trust it. Knowing that he is in charge and he is in control, that at the proper time, everything will be birthed and God will accomplish what needs to be. So in Luke 2, 6, 2, 6 it says, and then when they came there, the time came for the baby to be born. And understand that God spoke it into existence eons before it took place. Can I tell you that God is never late? He's never early. He's always on time, no matter what. I look at Galatians 4, 4, uh, 4, verses 4 and 5. It says that when the right time came, hear that statement. When the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the Lord, to do what? To buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law, law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. It tells me that in the timetable of God and all that is going on, the moment in time when you were going to be born, when I was born, and everything else was going to take place, that God had set an order in place, and in the midst of it, at the right time, at the right time, he not only sent his son to be born of a woman who was going to become subject to the law, but overshadow the law in the midst of it, so that he could do one thing, Thing, that the day and the moment of time that I was born, you were born, and I came to that place of understanding and grasping a hold of him, that freedom would come to me who was a slave to my, all my sins and all of it, and I would be totally set free. Why? Because he saw me, he saw you, and even though I don't deserve to be adopted, he adopted me as his own child. And he did it in his time. So you see, when it comes to the things of God, if I can learn to rest in him, God brings about great things in our hearts and lives. I look at First Chronicles 12 and 32. And there's some scriptures here that the nation of Israel is in some trying time. They were facing all manner and sort of thing that was going on around about them. But in the midst of it, they turned to the tribe of Issachar. <coughs> because they knew in the tribe of Issachar there were 200 men. And it says all these men, they knew one thing. They understood the signs of what? The times. And they knew the best course for Israel to take. What that's saying to you and me is this. 
is that God sets into motion and he brings people into the midst and he does circumstance and situation, does all manner and sort of things that bring about the greatness of all that God wants to do. And in the midst of it, when you and I can turn to those that God would place in our hearts and lives that can speak into our lives, the very truth, and, and you and I yield to what God's trying to do, that God will bring about things. Why? Because not only are the signs of the times understood, but the best course will be taken by each and every one of us when we trust God and we allow God to do what needs to be done. Somebody give him praise in his house. So you see, what I'm saying to you is that, <coughs> excuse me, you don't have to become anxious in the midst of what's going on around about you. You may get troubled, and we all do, but in the midst of the trouble, see, what most people do and what God, Satan wants you to do, he wants you to run. He wants you to take off. He wants you to give up and abandon everything because of your circumstances. But if you learn to know that there is a timetable that God has, and even though circumstances may not be as you want to be, that you belong to him, you are in the palm of his hand, and as you trust God in the midst of life, God will not only take you through, he'll see you through, he'll take you on the other side, he'll do what needs to be done, and victory will be yours. Why? Because God himself understands the sign of the times. And he knows the best course for you and me. All you and I need to do is just rest in him. And let God have his way. And instead of running and hiding, instead of giving up and allowing our emotions to be the thing that governs us, we start to let God be the one to govern us. Why? Because we realize that we are in his hand. We realize that even though I don't understand what's going on, God has a timetable for me. He has a timing in the midst of it, and all I need to do is rest in him. Does anybody understand what I'm saying this morning? But also in Ecclesiastes 3, 1, and I'll tie this together in the midst of what I also need to say. It says this, for everything there is a season. There is a time for every activity. In other words, every single purpose under heaven, God has a season and a time to accomplish whatever needs to be. That includes you. You had a time to be born. You had a time to birth and to do the things that God would have. And I want to come back to that thought. But in the midst of all of it, when you and I learn to rest and trust in God, no matter what is going on in our lives, and you and I start to pay attention, we'll discover that God's timetable time to come to pass in our life is not dependent upon me. It's not dependent upon you. But it's solely dependent upon God. And in spite of us, God's going to do something great in our lives if we'll just learn to do the one thing he calls us to do. And that's to rest in him. Are you hearing me this morning? See, that's the essence of the dilemma of our belief. Because you see, when it comes to believing, there's a few things that you and I need to grasp a hold of. There's three very important, but yet very simple things that you've got to do in your life and I've got to do in mine so that when I'm faced with believing, instead of running the opposite way, I rest in the Lord and victory becomes mine. What does it include? It's very simple. The first one is this. You've got to perceive to conceive. Let me say that to you again. You've got to learn to perceive in order to conceive. What I mean by that is simply this, that in the midst of the things that are going on in your life and all that transpires around about you, the enemy wants you to get your focus off of the Lord. Amen? He wants you to get your focus on all the circumstances that are going on. He wants you to lose sight of what it is that God's doing so that you will run in the other way. But when you can get to the place that when you know circumstances are happening and all of a sudden you stop what you're doing and you draw a deep breath and you say, Oh God, I may not understand what's going on, but I perceive that you're in the midst of doing something here great. That when I start to perceive that God's in the midst of it, that's when God can conceive inside of me what it is that I need need of so that I can walk in the faith that needs to be walked in so that I can accomplish what needs to be accomplished and God can do what needs to be done. When I get out of the way, that's when God becomes the way. Oh my goodness, somebody help me. You see, you've got to learn to perceive so that you can conceive 
what it is that God wants to do in you and through you. But that only happens when you understand that God has a timetable and a timing of the things that are going on in your life. That he is the one that literally directs your steps. He oversees the timing of your life. He is the one that directs your path. And in the midst of all that is going on, if you allow him to have his way, God will accomplish great and wondrous things. And as you start to perceive God working in the midst of it, he'll conceive inside of you and birth in you the very thing that he wants you to accomplish for his kingdom. Because that's that's what your life is all about. You fulfilling, me fulfilling, everything that God wants us to fulfill in this life so that we can become the instrument that brings glory and honor to his name. Somebody give him praise. See, going back to Ecclesiastes and 3, 1 and 2, it says, to everything there is a season. There is a time for every purpose under heaven. Is there a time to be born? There's a time to die. There's a time to plant. And there's a time to pluck up what is planted. In other words, when you allow God to be in control and God wants to plant something in you, if you let God have his way, he'll conceive it, he'll bring it to pass inside of your life, but you've got to be willing to stand still and let God be God. And that only happens when you understand who's in control, who's in charge, and that he has a timetable for everything in your life. Somebody give him praise. Second thing is this. You've got to believe in order to receive. You see, if you can't believe, if first and foremost, you've got to perceive it and then conceive it, so that in other words, what's birthed inside of you is the belief system to accomplish it, you'll never receive from God whatever it is that you, He wants to give you in your heart and your life. And so your life and my life comes to that place within the framework of all that is going on, that when you get all the junk out of the way, like this innkeeper needed to get out of the midst of his, and you and I need to get out of the midst of ours, that in the midst of what's going on, well, if I can see God in the midst of what's happening in my life, then all of a sudden I can believe. And if I can believe, I can receive. But that takes me seeing God in the midst of all of it. I may not understand it, but nonetheless, nonetheless, He is God. I'm in the palm of His hands. I don't understand it, but it doesn't matter. Why? Because He's in charge. Somebody give Him praise. <laughs> When you can grasp this, that's when God can transform things. That's when God can do what needs to be done. Believing God is stepping off the cliff and saying, Nonetheless, O oh God, if I should perish, so be it. But I'm in your hand. I'm mindful of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the midst of what was going on. And he, they basically said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Though they slay me, and though you kill me, though you burn me up in the fire, it does not matter. My God still rules and reigns. And he's still in charge. And I'm going to trust him nonetheless. Because that's what it's all about. Believing is all about knowing he's in charge. It's about trusting God no matter what. And allowing God to have his way no matter what. It's like planting seed for harvest. If you want to harvest on something, you've got to first plant it. Then you've got to water it before you'll ever reap the harvest. It's God's principles of reaping and sowing. It's like Paul said in Hebrews 11, 1 through 3. You know these verses of Scripture. Listen to it. He says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. That word, those words hoped for, literally means planting. And when I say literally, I'm talking about in the realm of the Spirit. Not literally in the natural. It's the things hoped for. In other words, I'm planting what it is that I have need of from God. And then it says it's the evidence of things not seen. That's literally the watering. I can't see it. It's in the ground. I don't know. But I'm going to water it nonetheless. I'm going to be praying. I'm going to be believing. I'm going to be trusting God because I know God's got a timetable. Are you hearing me this morning? He said, for by it the elders obtained a great testimony. They said, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. In other words, it took faith trusting God that in the midst of that faith all of a sudden God pulled back the curtain and you saw things not from your way but from God's way. And because I believed, I started to receive from God that which only God could imagine in my heart and my life. When that becomes a part of the fiber of who you are, 
It is all birthed from that very reality. That I may not understand it. I may never comprehend it. It does not matter. Why? Because I know whose I am. I know that I belong to him. And that God has a timing in everything in life. Abraham never received the fullness of the promise that God had for him. But nonetheless, it says that it was accounted unto him as faith believing God. And even though he didn't receive it in the natural, he received it in the spiritual realm. The fullness of the greatness of the kingdom of God. And to this day, as eons have passed in the midst from the time he drew his last breath onto this earth. Even though he didn't see it in the natural and he was here, he's walking in it right now. Are you hearing me today? Last thing is this. You got to go with the flow. I mean, it's real simple. You got to perceive to conceive. You got to believe to receive. And then the last thing you got to do in the midst of what God's trying to do in your heart and your life. So that literally you can overcome this, this, little, this little, little literal dilemma of believing, trusting God. You've got to learn to go with the flow. Three very basic principles. But they're so relevant to your walk with God. And so dependent on understanding that even though you may not see things as, they, as you want them to be right now. That you've got to trust God nonetheless. Knowing that God has a timing and if I can just hold my breath long enough, you know what I mean? If I can just trust him well enough, if I can just go with the flow, because see, God says in his word that he directs the steps of the righteous. He says that he governs my steps in the midst of all that's going on in my life. I may not understand them, but if I know he's in charge of them, then I just need to go with the flow. Look at your neighbor and say, I got to go with the flow. Look at your neighbor and say, you got to go with the flow. Because you see, if neither one of you go with the flow, what's happening <coughs> is you're literally going in the opposite direction of God's agenda. Because the flow of your life is God's agenda. In other words, he has a direction. And what you need to do is learn to yield to God and go in that direction. I'm mindful in the book of Ezekiel 47 and 9. It says, it says, where the river flows, everything will live. I love that verse. It's one of the favorite verses of mine in all the scripture. Why? Because it says, where the river, in other words, where God flows, everything lives. In other words, if you're flowing with God, you're going to live. If you're going in the opposite direction God's going in, guess what? You're going to drown. Are you hearing me this morning? But you see, it's like Amos 3 and 3. How can two people walk together unless they first come into agreement on the direction that they're going in? That's how the New Living Translation says it. You see, you might want to go in a direction, but if that's not the direction God's going in, then you're not going with the flow. And if you're not going with the flow, then you're coming against in opposition too. And how can you survive if you don't go with the flow? Let me close in this thought. The times that God sets into motion in your life, none of them, the good, the bad, and all the ugly, none of it's by accident. None of it. The innkeeper discovered that even in the midst of things. I mean, he had a dilemma facing him. And in the midst of the dilemma he was facing, the same dilemma that you and I face in the midst of life. Circumstances happen that you have no control of. But when you know that God's in control, he's got a timetable, you learn to rest in it, and you learn to go with his flow. Too many people, and I'm not pointing fingers, but too many of us, when things aren't going the way we want to go, you can tell the person who's not going with the flow. You know why? Because all they do is complain. If you're a complainer, you're quiet on me. If you're a complainer, you're not one that goes with the flow. Literally, you're walking opposite of where God's going. 
So you see, you learn that lesson. Here's what happens. You recognize that everything that goes on in your life is by God's divine design. You see this in the midst of the Christmas story. You see God's hand at work. And the dilemma of our belief, and this is my closing thought, can be summed up in Romans 8, 28 and 29. Listen to the words of the Apostle Paul, man who understood God's timing. He used to walk opposite to it, ran right into it. It transformed his life. And he spent the rest of his days yielding and going with the flow of God. He said these words, and we know that all things, we know that some things, we know that every once in a while things. No, he said we know that all things. That means everything in your life works together for good to those who love God. Is there anybody out there that loves God this morning? I need a show of hands if you love God this morning. He's looking down. He wants to know. Who love God to those who are called, the called, the called, according to his purpose. If you love God, you are part of the called according to his purpose. He proclaims that. And he goes on and he closes with this. And this is about the timing. He says, for whom God foreknew. It says, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That statement is all about one thing. God's timing. God's timetable. God at work in your life. Now you can either go with the flow or you can resist God. See, the dilemma of our belief boils down to that one simple thing. Either God's in charge or he's not. Either I'm going to trust him or I'm not. Either I'm going to go with him or I'm not. Those that go kicking and screaming really aren't going. Would you stand with me? Father, this morning, you have spoken into our hearts and lives make many great and wondrous things. You've ministered into the hearts and lives of these, your precious children, in some very unique ways. I'm excited to hear what it is that you've done today in this service into some of their lives. The way you poured yourself out and the way you've blessed them and the way that you wanted to accomplish things. I'm excited to hear from those that were watching online that literally you invaded their lives and, and did things in their hearts. But Lord, I'm more than anxious to discover those that you planted seed in today in such a measure, in such a way, through this your precious word, that from this moment on, the light bulbs come on, and all of a sudden they understand the dynamics of relationship with you, and believing and trusting you, and allowing you to be fully in charge. Because Lord, until we get out of the way, and let you become the way, Never, Lord, will we ever accomplish what you desire for us and you design for us to do. So, Lord, in closing, I simply ask that you would speak into every heart and every life that is here today. That, Lord, if they recognize from your words that you've spoken today that they're totally not surrendered to you, that, Lord, right this very moment, they would surrender everything to you. That, Lord, out of the midst of the words that you spoke today into our hearts and lives, if they recognize that, Lord, they're distant from you. And they don't know you as Savior and Lord, that right now, today, they would simply surrender their heart to you for the first time, for the second time, for the fifth time, whatever it may be. But in this time, the surrender would be what needs to be. So that, Lord, they'd be hooked to your timetable. And they'd be able to receive from you all that it is they need. And that they'd recognize that today is that time that you've set in motion for them. And as they surrender, you would flood their lives with your glory. 
And Lord, the last thing I would like to say is that as you've tugged upon every one of our hearts today, and as you've helped us to be able to recognize the things that we need to see, that as we get ready to leave your sanctuary today, that Lord, as we reach out and we grab a hold of your hand today, that you take us by the hand, you set us in motion into the timetable that you have for us, you reveal it to us in a special way, and that Lord, through that, you'd cause faith to rise up in us and measure in way that'll cause us to become everything that you've called us to be, you created us to be, and you've desired before the foundation of this earth that you wanted us to be. I ask it in the matchless name of Jesus, Father. Now go before my brothers and my sisters, bless them as only you can, and for that we'll give you alone all the praise in Jesus' mighty name. And the church said, Amen. Good Lord, and offering of praise. Thanks for being with us today. Lord bless you.